Welcome to the Merle End. I'm Dominic Machado, and I am joined today by Nick Brooks, the doyen of Sri Lankan cricket and everyone's favorite Sri Lankan sports journalist, Estelle Vasudevan. Um, before we get started, I want to ask everyone, whether you're listening on YouTube, listening on your podcast, following along on Facebook, hit a like, give us a subscribe, leave us your comments. We love reading your comments, even when you disagree with us. In fact, better when you disagree with us. And um, keep your eyes peeled for some newsletter content. Subscribe to the newsletter. We've got some good stuff coming up, especially with the England Test Series beckoning. All right. But England Test Series is not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a historic win for the Sri Lankan men's team for the first time in 27 years. They have defeated India in a bilateral ODI series. Estelle, I'm going to come to you because you were at the ground this afternoon what was it like? What was the fan base like? What was the atmosphere like? Yeah, it was back. Everything was okay, right? All of a sudden, after, you know, every single failure we've seen over the last couple of uh, years, it seemed like everything was okay. I mean, uh, big crowds in, house full, I think. Um, lots of noise, uh, crowds staying on well past the game ending. Um and some really good cricket from Sri Lanka as well. So I think the feeling within the camp is also pretty good. The vibes are good outside. Everyone's kind of uh, thinking positive about what's to come. Obviously, the Asalanka Sanat era has started off well. Yeah. Nick, so can you give us again, I'm going to go to you as the historian, a historical comparison for, for a win like this? Because you know, coming into this series, I thought, okay, we're coming into this this whole tour, India tour of Sri Lanka. I thought, okay, we might have a chance to take a game off them in the T20s. And maybe if we're lucky, we could get two. But there's a pretty significant gulf between the two teams in ODIs, and we're likely to get smashed. And given what's happened over the past year, this is a really surprising result. Is there anything that you can think of that that matches this or that's similar to this? I mean, the only thing I've got, Dom, I, you, I've got to take it right back to 1964-65 okay. when it was still Ceylon touring India and they were on a three unofficial test tour. They got smashed in the first two tests. I think they lost them both by an innings. And then they went to Ahmedabad on a rainy, uncovered wicket. Um, they uh, Michael Tessera declared when Sri Lanka was still behind and they bowled India out on the final morning for nothing and chased the runs down. Uh, crazy, complete shot out of the bolt victory. Um, but that was just one game. And here we've seen them, I mean, go unbeaten against an India team who caused them nightmares last year. Uh, on a three-game unbeaten streak. I mean, it just defies belief. You can't create these storylines with Sri Lankan cricket. There's nothing else like it. And I mean, how good is it to see Ketarama rocking, to see the stands packed with fans bringing a bit of joy back to the island? Yeah, that I mean, that's the most encouraging thing, right? You know, we're we're a podcast, we're all, but we're also fans of Sri Lankan cricket and. When the team wins, seeing how much it means to the people who are watching it is just something that brings you joy. And we'll talk about all the caveats. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Estelle, tell me what it was like you were on the ground. Um, when I was watching it, the first 25 overs that Sri Lanka batted, I thought, okay, this is a decent batting pitch. They should probably try to get to 280, maybe sniff 300 if they're going to want to get a competitive score up there. But did you? what did you notice about how the pitch changed over – um, the course of the afternoon. It was an interesting one, right? And I think that's how it's been all series where you're not quite sure what's going on, but something is definitely going on. You're right. I think at the beginning of Sri Lanka's innings, you thought they would be hitting something close to 280. And then when they were struggling to get there, you had to wonder whether this is a problem with the Sri Lankan batting because we've seen collapses um, in the T20s, right? And in the ODI no. as well early on. Whether it's bad batting or whether there was something happening on the pitch. And it seemed like it was slowing down a lot. Um, I think around the 40 over mark, uh, Scott, Scott Styris, who is in the commentary box, um, was just saying off air that, 260 would be a very, very good target. 
Uh, but Sri Lanka were not sure of whether they will get close to 260 at that point because they had slowed down considerably. Um, so it's interesting to see the conditions and also because Sri Lanka never got to chase, right? Yeah. So we don't, like it's very difficult to assess are India that terrible in spin-friendly conditions or was it significantly harder chasing um, and batting under lights at the Kettarama? Yeah, the the question of the toss uh, was was very, very big here, right? And in fact, every time the first two ODIs when I saw Rohit batting in the power play, I thought, why are we batting first? But it seemed like Charith made the right call there and it ended up having a massive impact on how the game played out if it really was more difficult to chase under lights. Um, and it seemed like the ball was keeping a bit low. That caused a lot of trouble. So when Avishka eventually gets out on 96... It was, I think it was Rian Parag. The ball just kind of scooted onto him and hit him right on the front pad. There was nothing really he could he could do for that. And and we saw with the Indian batters, they tried to play their shots. And they might get one or two shots away. But eventually there was a ball with their name on it. And, um, and they were getting out. Uh, Nick, what did you make of the sort of move? And, and now we'll start to kind of ask the bigger picture questions. The move to prepare pitches like this at, at the Ketarama, right? And this is kind of what you can expect, right? A slow, low turner when you come to Colombo. But what did you make of, you know, the start of the Sanath Charith era? These are the three pitches we're going to lay out against India, and they're, we're going to dare them to beat us at home. Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, in hindsight, now the series has been won, and given all that became, came before it, I kind of like it. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt, right, that going into this series, there were a lot of skeletons in Sri Lanka's closet. Uh, from both the T20 series that we've just witnessed and those two games last year, the World Cup game and the Asia Cup final game, I mean, like, I think that everyone in that Sri Lankan team was probably coming into this series thinking in the back of their mind, like, oh, shit, what is going to happen here? <laughs> and so, I mean, we've said a lot, on in our last podcast and we've been taken to town for it that we don't think Sri Lanka should play on these kind of pitches all the time. I stick by that. But I think you've got to say the priority here is building confidence, doing as the best they could to compete against India and um, getting this tenure off to a good start, eradicating the me those horrible memories. And they've done that emphatically, right? Um, I'm surprised that these pitches, I mean, you'd expect the India batters to be good players of spin too. As you say, um, maybe it was considerably easier posting than it was chasing. But the fact that um, Sri Lanka looked, I mean, especially today, like the much better team was surprising. But yeah, I don't mind that they prepared pitches that they thought gave them the best chance. And now we're sitting here looking back on the first series win over India in 27 years and thinking it's a bit of a masterstroke, right? Yeah, it, it's an interesting decision here, right? So um, I think if we look historically, and Matt Kabir Floyd, who we had on the podcast prior to the series, pointed this out, that Sri Lanka has now won eight consecutive series, ODI series at home since 2021. And if you count in their 2023 Asia Cup run where they made it to the final and where they almost upended India in a game where they chased at the Katara Katarama there and then ended up falling just short, right? They've played pretty well at home. And so Estelle, I think my, my thought or my question is how do we reconcile, right? Okay. We're playing pretty well at home. We have a good record in one day or is at home for the past five years, right? We've beaten India and Australia, right? Um, with the results we're seeing more broadly, like we lost a series to Bangladesh earlier this year, right? Even setting apart the 2023 World Cup. How do we, how do we kind of make sense of that? What's the proper move going forward? And how can we kind of say, okay, there are some good pieces in here, but maybe not all those pieces translate well to other circumstances it's an interesting one right i i think like nick i stand by our thoughts from the last pot i do think that in the long run 
if we consistently play on in conditions like this it's going to be detrimental and i also agree that and i think i mentioned it in the previous part as well about it is a good way to get confidence because like nick said right every batter in that side is coming in thinking the last two games we played against them we were bowled out for 50 right everyone's thinking that no i, I don't think even the best sports psychologist on earth can remove that from your mind right because <laughs> 50 all out not once i mean the asia cup final you can write off saying okay you know what it happens but it happened again like a month later right so every batter was probably coming in thinking about it um so winning winning this series it's really important for the confidence of the players and to kind of get them into thinking that you know india's not a unbeatable mm. side it's not an invincible side they they can they are, they have weaknesses that can be exploited and they've done exactly that so you know you have to give plaudits for that right and understanding that this is the way we can beat india mm. right it's mm. great uh the concern for me and it, it's what we pointed out last time right it's bilaterals no longer have any significance apart from ranking points uh there's no odi super league um it's not like the world test championship where you are awarded something at the end right mm. so they don't really have any significance or any consequences right so then are you going to use them to build towards something bigger or you know are you going to focus on that series alone yeah. i think like i said if it's if it's about confidence and it's going to be this series you want to build confidence against a team like india then it's mm -hmm. fine because i mean you look at india it's the full strength team right apart from bumra they are yeah. they are their top players right so that would definitely give sri lanka a lot of confidence um i hope it's not a long term thing where we have that consistently and to be honest like it's refreshing that we saw in dabulla and palakale yeah. much more better friendly conditions I just want to reiterate for like the people who, you know, disagreed with us in the previous part. It's not, I'm not saying it's not enjoyable. It is. I would prefer low scoring game yeah. every day, right? Rather than the 400 plus games. But it's also understanding where the game is going. And um, I think we were discussing it in our WhatsApp chat, right? Like I looked at the numbers from the last two ODI World Cups and in 2019, the fastest scoring team won, England won, right? They were, I think, one of two teams that were scoring mm -hmm. at over six runs and over on average throughout the tournament. And then in 2023, the four fastest scoring teams were the semi-finalists. Yeah. So there's obviously a correlation between scoring fast in ODI cricket and having success. So we, we, those are facts, right? Like you can't deny that that's where the game is going, right? Whether it will come back, I don't know. It it it, yeah. it seems unlikely to do so in the, you know, in the, in the near future, right? So <coughs> if we are looking ahead like that, then I think as Nick mentioned, we need to kind of have one eye on mm -hmm. what is our main goal. And that should be to compete well at the World Cup in South Africa, right? Um, I'm sure this will give the players a lot of confidence. So that is awesome. And also, you have to say, whatever conditions it is beating India in a three-match series and not losing a single game mm. is a huge achievement. And we were talking off air about, you know, it's very hard to imagine that since 1997, we haven't beaten them because we've had some pretty special teams during that period, right? Particularly if you look at like, 2003 to maybe 2014 some great yeah. players in those lineups but we haven't beaten them in a bilateral which is i mean incredible to think that now we've achieved that against possibly one of india's best ever teams yeah. right so it is a massive achievement just it's also tempered by the fact that we don't want to see this uh consistently happen because it could be detrimental right yeah. another fact on the like just to go into what nick was talking about india's india playing spin um, actually a journalist at the press box he was talking about we were talking about why that is right because to me it's it's very strange you look at them at the asia cup last year 
them not being able to play spin is very strange, right? Because in test cricket, they yeah. probably handle spin perfectly fine because those are the conditions they play at at home. Uh, and he was talking about how because of their schedules being so busy, a lot of them don't play domestic cricket. In India, so they don't play their list day cricket, right? And so they don't, they aren't really exposed to that many, you know, slow pitchers, right? Because in international cricket, barring maybe Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, you get flat tracks everywhere you go, whether you go to England, Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, South Africa, wherever you go, you're getting flat tracks. So they aren't, they aren't accustomed to playing. Whereas Sri Lanka, domestic cricket, you're playing in a lot of speed friendly conditions, right? And I think Mahish Tikshana mentioned that yeah. uh, um, during the game as well in an interview saying that, you know, our batters are used to playing in conditions like this. And that's why you see guys like Dunit Vela, Lage, even Kamindu Mendis, right, coming up the ranks because they've got gotten so used to playing in conditions where they need to use their wrists and power is not really the priority, mm. right? Um, so it's a very interesting thing to get back, I mean, I know I've rambled on a little bit, but to get back, I think it's a great achievement. There's no doubt about it. And we shouldn't be taking away from, you know, um, the, the the praise for winning. But also, hopefully, it, it is something with a plan in mind and a long-term plan in mind where you want to build their confidence first and then you want to work towards certain yeah. other areas and you know build up certain other skills that you will need when you want to go overseas and win yeah i think um the confidence point is still is really important so i remember on the back of that australia series is when we went and won the asia cup right right on the back of that so playing well definitely has some positive impact so we'll see what happens because I think the next two series are coming up September, October, New Zealand and West Indies are coming for white ball series. So we'll see what kind of tracks are prepared. We'll see how they play it, see what changes. Um, I think that'll be very interesting. I also want to point out to the viewers um, how Rohit reacted, right? Because Roshan Abe Singh uh, kind of asked him, you know, how do you feel about this loss? Is it concerning? And Rohit kind of, you know, he, he all but said, like, well, it's just a series loss. We have a good team. We back our players. We know what they can do. Sure, are there things we're going to work on and, and prepare for for the future? Yeah, but he understood that this is one series played in particular conditions and doesn't detract from their ability to win a World Cup or to do whatever they need to do in 2027. And I think that's how Sri Lanka should take it. Yes, it's a great series win, but... We don't want to get too high or too low from those moments, mm -hmm. right? You're you're sort of never as good or as bad, yeah. right? Are we a better one day team than India? Absolutely not, right? Um, but are as we are we as bad as we thought we were? Probably not either, right? We know that we could beat India in our home conditions, right? That's one box checked, but there's ten other boxes that we still have to check, and that's it's something to be proud of. It's, we should be proud of beating a full strength India team, but we should realize that in the grand scheme of things, it adds to the confidence, it adds to the morale, but it might not portend necessarily well for, as Estelle said, in India, in England, in South Africa, where the pitches are different. Um, and I think where it hurts them is like, if you look at the batting lineup, right, where you're batting someone like Kamindu Mendes at eight, there's no other place in the world where he's going to bat at eight or where that's a, even a reasonable decision. Um, when Sri Lanka were batting well, and I forget what it was, but they were about 190 for one when Avishka got out, right? And I was thinking, who is going to provide the finishing kick here? Who is going to take them above 300 if that's, that's what they need to score, right? And the way that this team was set up, if they had to go score 350 – it would have been very, very hard for them to do unless one of the openers or your number three goes for 150 plus runs. And so thinking about what are the long term ways to win when it, when the pitch is 240, 250, 260. Yeah, sure. But what is it going to look like if they play an overseas white ball series? Right. Because they're going to have to change tactically. You can't play one seamer and you can't play Mahesh as basically your, your secondary seamer um, and give him the power play overs. So that adaptation still has to go on. Um, so I think I'm sure we'll get more comments. See, please do leave more comments and questions about strategy here. But I want to delve into the players. And obviously, 
I want to start with the man of the series here, Dunes Willalage, right? So he wins player of the series. Fantastic accomplishment. Um, Nick, what have you seen from him in terms of growth as a batter and as a bowler over the last couple of years? I think that um, beyond anything, he's just clearly got a really good mentality, right? He looks like a hard worker, a guy who's filled with confidence. I mean, he came into the side when he was still a schoolboy and looked at home kind of right away. And ever since there, every time we've seen him, I feel like he just keeps building and building and building. We saw him bat two fantastic innings and he bowled really nicely today, right? Used the pitch well. Mm -hmm. He was bowling at a nice pace, getting really good turn. Uh, and I mean, yeah, I just love watching him uh every time i see him play i really enjoy watching it and it just looks like he's growing and getting better the kind of the same thing that we saw with patham right who a guy who came in with a lot of hype um but with limitations and really worked and built on them and i think you can see the same kind of thing happening with dunithla right uh we've seen him bring more power into his batting it looks like uh in terms of bowling he's understanding how to vary his paces um according to wick the wickets uh he's mixing in those sort of arm balls really nicely and uh i'm just really excited to see where his career goes i mean how old is he is he still 20 is he um 21 i think 21, I think he's 21. Um, so no, he's going to be a huge building block for Sri Lanka moving forward. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I wonder whether we'll see him. We discussed it last time, whether he ends up batting, you know, at, at six or higher. Um, and he looks like he can bowl in various stages of the game. So I think he's really exciting. He's a dynamic fielder too. Uh, great package for Sri Lanka. And it's a really good confidence building series for him right i know that we've said this is just one building block but i do think that one of the main things we've seen this team struggle with over the past two years is confidence is mentality yeah. is that like sense that their tail goes between their legs when things don't go right and so i think for players like dunith um like avishka getting a big score today this is something that they can um kind of carry forward with them that it's a little peg in their brain that they can tick back on and think, you know, I've done it against India. Um, yeah. And so I think that's really important. Yeah, no, I, I hundred percent agree with the, um, idea he's adding more, um, skills, right? Like Potham, each time you see him, you're like, he's a little bit better than the last time I saw him. It's not, here's the package. This is what you get. Yeah. He's going to be great some days, bad some other days. He's added a little bit. He's added some power, right? He he looks much more confident batting at the international level. Um, and he's bowling with good pace. I think, to me, he looks like a really good prospect for T20s as well. And I'm hoping that his performance may get him noticed by some leagues around the world, which I think would be really crucial to his performance, who might use him a little bit differently than Sri Lanka, rather than say, okay, come in at seven, and and kind of patch things up they might ask him to come in at three and four and 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 hit the ball around a little bit more they might ask him to open the bowling they might ask him to control the middle overs and all that is going to just add uh to his skill set and make him a bigger and bigger um contributor to sri lankan cricket um i was glad tikshana got a game he bowled really well and you see his value once again um estelle i want to ask you about avishka i was feeling kind of sick to my stomach after that first game when he got a low score and I thought, oh, okay, here we go. The fish goes low on confidence after not getting a game, but he's put in two good performances and he ends the series, I believe, as the leading run getter. Um, what did you make of Avishka's performance over the, the over this series? He's one of those players, isn't he, that you, when he gets going, there's no one who who's quite like him right when he gets when he starts hitting the ball off the middle of the bat there's nobody like him and we saw that like how he burst onto the scene ag against England in that world mm. cup and I'm so glad that Nick mentioned the confidence factor I think it's something that we overlook a lot um yes this the skill is an issue right there's no denying that there is an issue with the skill but most most of these players are confidence players like you get one win under your belt you get one good performance under your belt and you suddenly start believing that you can do a 
do something else in the next game right and we've seen that not just with the men's team actually even looking back at the women's performance over the last mm. two years right a lot of that is just belief it's yes it's development of skill there is that angle as well but a lot of it is belief that what the work they've put in and you know the the uh the skills that they have the talent that they have can help them do the job, right? And that's what we're seeing from guys like Avishka Fernando. Um, you can see the day he gets out for a zero, right? His shoulders drop and his body language mm. is, you know, not that great on the field. But when he gets runs, he seems like a completely different player. Like he had a couple of close calls today. Um, but once he survived that, and I think, Nick, you were the one who pointed out, right? Like the, the stat on his yeah. starts uh, out between zero and nine, 42% of his entire ODI career. So once he gets past 10, he's, he's obviously tough to get out. So I think, again, it's a, it's a mental thing, right? And it helped, I think, that there was no left armor today. Um, mm. So he didn't have even that. It is a skill issue, but it's also kind of a mental issue, right? Facing that left armor and that anger. Um, so I'm really happy for him. I think he's, you know, he's made for yeah. ODI cricket. I don't know whether he's, he's, I'm still on the fence, whether he's the T20 player you want in either opening or in the middle order, but certainly ODI cricket. I feel like mm. he's, he's made for the, he's made for the format. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree, and and I think that left arm struggle, it's all about confidence. It's early in your innings. Are you getting your stride across? Because half the time, it's he's he's about to play a shot, and then he pulls back at the last second, and the ball comes off the bat, right? And that tells me he's short on confidence. He's not sure whether to play or leave, right? And then once he gets into an innings, we see he has all the shots in the world. He has all the time in the world to play those shots. Um, he's he can be aggressive. He can be dominating. Um, and it it was really, really good to see that. Last thing I want to touch on is um, Kusal Mendes' innings in number in a number of ways brought a bunch of controversies out. So one was, um, how do we understand that innings, right? So it looks like Sri Lanka is going great guns. They're going to score 280, 300 maybe. And then all of a sudden, the dots start showing up, right? Um, then Kusal turns it on a little bit. Uh, scores a few boundaries and then gets caught notionally on the rope by Shubman Gill. Um, it turns out from pictures that mm, Shubman Gill's foot was on the rope. That should have been a six. And so, uh, you know, and then, and then he got into a little bit of an argy bargy with uh, Mohammed Siraj too, I think. So, you know, when, when it comes to Sri Lankan cricket these days, Kusal Mendes is always in the news, always in the, um, in the headlines. What did you make of his performance in this series and where he kind of fits in the squad going forward as he gets as he gets kind of older? Nick, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? He's um, he started really slowly in all three ODIs, right? He's been taking balls to bed in. But you look at the pitches and what everyone else has done and you have to think that's probably a sensible approach. Today, I've got to admit, I was one of those people who was thinking that the Sri Lankan innings had kind of hit the skids and that they were wanting to look towards 280. And I mean, it was just a strange one, wasn't it? From the time when after Avishka got out, really, uh, everything just kind of seemed to grind to a halt. It's been a pretty tough series for the middle order, hasn't it? Charith, Sadira yeah. and Lianage kind of feel like they've hardly had a run between them. Um, Lianage managed to get himself walk off when he hadn't hit the ball as well, which was an interesting one the other day. Um, but in hindsight, it looks like Kusal paced that innings really, really well. Uh, he managed to drag Sri Lanka up to close to the 250 mark. I think that, you know, when wickets are constantly falling at the other end, you feel like you can't press the gas that much. And I think there was a bit of that today. And then he really started to get going those last few overs. And we might have seen a few more boundaries if he hadn't been... Um, erroneously given out, which was a strange decision. We only got, I think, yeah. one replay, one from behind that the third umpire saw. And even from that one, I thought it looked like the foot was touching the rope. The decision was made hastily and in hindsight was clearly the wrong one. But 
a shout out to Kamindu Mendes as well, who I thought played another really great knock today. He's come in midway through the series and played two really valuable finishing contributions. Uh, he looks to me, like I said it on our WhatsApp thread, like one of the cleanest strikers of the ball in this squad. He's got long levers. He can get under that ball and hit sixes. And um, I think he looks a really promising ODI player. And I'm interested to see how they use him moving forward. Uh whether he bats up the order, I think he's got the potential to it, or whether they see him as a finisher. Maybe if Liana Gate isn't locked on at six, is Kamindu an option there? Um, but I think Kusal is still really this team's everything man, right? We saw in India in the World Cup that he played a couple of innings at the start of that tournament that we haven't seen anyone else in this squad able to play that kind of knock. He's also done repair jobs. I think he can do whatever the team needs for him. Uh, but he's another confidence player, isn't he? And um, when he's on song, uh, there's greatness there. And so I hope that we see the best of him moving forward in the next couple of years, The probably the last um, years of his prime, the next couple of years. And I still think that he probably hasn't delivered quite as much as he's promised. Um, and I think he still can. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what he does moving forward. And I think he's a guy who really can bat anywhere in the top five. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's interesting, right, is that I, I think the problem is he can do it all. So I think mm. we expect him to do it all. But as we've seen in the T20s, when you give him role clarity, it's much more effective. And I think that's that to me is the big point that we need to kind of take out of the series is what kind of role clarity can we give to players to make it easier, right? And again, Estelle mentioned confidence. When you're confident in what you have to do and you know what you have to do and it's a simple plan, you can go out there and execute. If you have to, if you're thinking in your head, okay, I'm coming in at eight today or am I coming in at seven or am I coming in at six and am I doing a repair job or am I finishing the innings? That's where we've got to kind of improve. We've got to improve strategically. India changed their batting lineup, but you could tell why they were changing their batting lineup, whether it was to maintain left-right combinations, to get a spin hitter out there, to try someone up the order to see what they could do, right? Um, we talked about Washington Sundar going up the order, too. Um, Estelle, since you were on the ground, I just want to ask you, what did you make of that umpire's decision to not call it a six? Did you Could you see it from where you were? Yeah, the funny thing was that it was right in front of us for, in the press box. And it didn't look like, it really looked like he misjudged it and stepped on the rope and then put it up. Yeah. That's what it looked like to the naked eye. Of course, the replays, I didn't pay too much attention because, you know. You couldn't really see anything. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't see anything on the Because replay. they didn't they give didn't... enough angles, right? Yeah. They didn't have the angle <laughs> of like, here is the foot. They yeah. just like, yeah. Yeah. But it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't uh, reflect well on Shubman either, does it? Because it was obvious that he'd stepped on the rope um, and then thrown the ball up when you look. I mean, yeah. we've, we've all seen the picture, right? So, um, yeah, interesting decision. The fact that angles were not available to see um, the foot was interesting. But I've, I've heard a lot of people saying that even from the yeah. back angle, it did seem like there was some part of the foot touching the rope. So, yeah, luckily it didn't cost Sri Lanka, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I think we should wrap it up there. It's a great day for Sri Lankan cricket. We take these wins when we get them. First bilateral series win in over 27 years. If you've been listening to us, we're the Merle End. Give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, on Facebook. Um, Give us a follow if you're listening to us on a podcast and subscribe to our newsletter. We've got some good stuff coming out in the future. And we will be back very soon to preview the women's tour to Ireland, which should promise to be fun, and to talk about the men's test team for England. All right. Thank you. Bye.